Okay, could we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing for a moment of silence for Chuck Crist. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any changes to the agenda? We do not. Okay, then I need a motion to approve the agenda. Motion by Sue, second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. And let's go to our uh, presentation of the diploma. Uh, members of the board and members of the community on Zoom and our honored guest here, uh, Mr. Tristan Bess. Um, I would like to begin this presentation by turning it over to Mr. Siebert. Thank you, Mr. Bridenstine, members of the Board of Education. Um, on Saturday at our retreat, we talked about celebrating the accomplishments of students. And uh, today we are able to celebrate the accomplishment of Tristan Bess as the most recent graduate and most recent alumni of Salamanca High School. Tristan uh, was supposed to graduate um, a couple of years ago and as we all know, sometimes life throws us some curveballs, and Tristan battled through those. And one of the most important things that I am proud of Tristan for is late in August and early September, he reached out back to the school to Mrs. Sibilio, his guidance counselor, who he has a fantastic relationship with, and said, what do I need to do to graduate? He took that step forward and we had a plan together for him and he came in and hammered it out within a couple of weeks i think it was about three weeks and was able to earn his diploma and that perseverance and resiliency is what is just huge in my opinion and it makes him a true warrior the fact that this was obviously important to him all along but he made the decision to actually finish pursuing it two years after the fact is just a great testament to who he is. And I am super proud to recommend to the Board of Education of Mr. Bridenstein, Tristan Bess, as a graduate of Salamanca High School. So, Tristan. As is normally the custom at graduation, they give me the microphone last. So I'm not going to let that opportunity uh, slip through my fingers. So I do want to say a few words specifically that um, I think you and your family can be proud of, but the district can also be proud of. You, as a young man and a student, exemplify the true tenacity of a warrior. A global pandemic and extreme social distancing and life didn't deter you from what is an incredible accomplishment and a goal. And while the world around us is seemingly crumbling and falling apart, you remind us of what focus, perseverance, grit, and determination can overcome. When Mr. Siebert told me a short time ago that you had actually crossed the finish line, I sat back in my chair and I reflected and said to myself, we could all learn a little bit from Tristan. You've done the job, you've gotten it done, and however long it took you is irrelevant. And in the history of time, no one will ask you how long did it take, just that you did it. 
we are proud of you and all that you have accomplished to this point. But I, I think, share the feelings of everyone in this room and in Warrior Nation are thrilled to ponder the possibilities of what you will accomplish next. And whatever that may be, I hope that you will keep us in that loop so we can continue to celebrate. And while this may not have been the path you envisioned, it is still your path and something you can be proud of. And I can say with absolute certainty, while all of this stuff that's happening around us isn't what any of us wished for, you are exactly the student we have dreamed about. Every day, every year, from pre-K till now, we have invested in you and you have risen to that challenge and we are so proud. And so I'd ask you, Tristan, to please stand. This is the best part. By the power entrusted to me by the New York State Education Department and the Board of Education of the Salamanca City Central School District, as a superintendent of schools, I duly convey graduation status upon you, Tristan Bess, for you have successfully completed all requirements and fulfilled all obligations. With pride and deep admiration, I hereby award to you your New York State High School Diploma. I just want to say, uh, I just want to say thank you to Mr. Siebert, to Mr. Bridenstein. I want to say thank you to all the teachers that have guided me and have pushed me even when I told them no and tried telling them like that I wasn't going to do it. They still pushed me to do it anyways. And in the end, I'm glad that I overcame my demons and that I battled them. And I'm glad that I'm here today to get my diploma so that I can move forward my life and hopefully um, excel as a better person so that I can show my peers and show the people that of the younger generation that it doesn't matter how you do it. It doesn't matter when you do it. It just matters that you do it. And it matters that you get it done and that you prove that you can do it. And that's honestly the best way that I can put it for you. Thank you. That's going to be tough to top. So <laughs> I don't think our next presenters are going to be able to beat that one. <laughs> OK, at this point, we can turn it over to our friends uh, uh, from Turner and um, talk about our capital project. <laughs> yeah, but those are the moments we want. Bless that was going to be a little tough to follow. Um, congratulations. It is truly a, a remarkable accomplishment when you, there's a pause and you find it in yourself to stand back up and hurdle adversity to accomplish what you want to in life. I commend them for that. Tonight we have a simple, straightforward presentation. It's pretty, uh, pretty simplistic overall. A lot of the work for phase one and phase two is wrapping up. The team will go into some of the punch list status. Uh, Michelle will talk about changes. Michelle, are you on? I am. Okay. Um, and we're just gonna go through some pictures of what Betts Park is. So for tonight, oops, yeah, that didn't go. Thank you. 
picture of that compliment to you, Bob, uh, prior to patient. Uh, once it's a little warmer, Levi gets back out there, he'll show you what it looks like with the paper in place. But Julian, Rich, Michelle, you guys want to? All right, so just uh, kind of a repeat from the, the last board update, just status update on where we're at punch list wise. For phase one, we dropped a couple of items. The items that are remaining are three long lead items that we just replaced or accepted coming in the month as well. We're done by the end of the year. Um, we're 99%. Over at Prospect, we're still pushing the complete punch list. Last board meeting, we had 180 items. Now we're at 43 pushing to get those complete here shortly. We have a couple long lead items like the bench over at the playground, but we're working through that and the drinking fountain due to COVID long lead item. So pushing to get that done. For phase 3.1, happy to say all work for done all the punches. Shall you have an update on open changes? Yep. Um, so right here, we are actually showing some in green and sorry, some in red and some in green. The green ones that are open in, in either, you know, Hunt or Turner's court, and there's one maybe in the owner's court. The ones that are in green are ones circulating for signature. You'll see a list of them, I believe, are up for approval in the board meeting tonight. They're in this count here in green, most of those. Um, for phase one, we have six open items. Um, two of them are just finalizing some power studies, um, another one finalizing a contractor's allowance, and then there's a couple of district requests in there that we're finishing up, the contractors are finishing up. The uh, phase two, we have one open that we're currently reviewing and getting prepping for cover sheet. The other 29 are out for signature. In phase 3.1, we currently have none open. They're all circulating for signature. We anticipate closing all phase one contractors out by December 31st, final paid, as well as phase 3.1 and phase two right around the first of the year. So similar to last update, just some progress photos here. For the top left picture that you see here, that's the existing building, the baseball team room and storage building. Uh, finishes in that area are complete. Floors been painted, walls have been painted, and we've actually started storing some of the district items in that area. Bottom left picture, tile work has started to progress in some of the bathrooms and what we call building A, that baseball team room building. The middle two pictures are your baseball press box. Top picture is downstairs, one of the bathrooms that finished paint on the wall, ceiling grid is in with some light fixtures that have been installed. Bottom middle picture is your actual press box, the second floor of that building. All the floors have been installed, finished paint on the walls, and lights are hung in this year, which will go in the beginning of December. And the right hand picture there, that's more of the epoxy floors. That's one of your baseball areas. The press box, grandstand, and bleachers. So the smaller sets of bleachers at the baseball and and box lacrosse areas have been installed. The middle picture here, a little bit further to the left. Some of you guys might have had questions on the difference in color from the left to the right. We got all the seat backs on the, that bleacher, so it looks consistent across the board color. The right-hand picture here, that's the press box support frame where the manufacturers waiting on their windows are a little bit delayed because of COVID for expecting the press box to be delivered on the, the 15th of December. The multi-purpose field team rooms, the top left, we have some of the coiling doors installed at the concession stand. The bottom left picture, the floor has been painted in the concession stand and wall paint has gone on. There is some tile work that's going to progress in December in that area behind some of the, the cooking areas. The middle picture is the progress of the epoxy floors and um, bathroom fixtures going on the walls. And then the right hand picture is progress of the exterior upgrades on, on the building. We have some light fixtures going in and the prefabricated canopy was installed over the last couple of weeks. Site work and landscaping, we finished all the site concrete for the job and we're able to pave last Thursday and Friday. We got the first coat of pavement down the binder coat 
and then the, they'll wait till the spring for, for some nicer weather and, and good cure time to, to place the top coat of that. The top right picture is your walking trail. We got the site lights in. They'll be wrapping up the last few of those that they have later this week and then get all the sub base prepped for the remainder of the asphalt to complete that walking trail over the next week or so. And then the bottom right hand picture is your, your batting cage installed and some trees that were recently planted over there as well. We've trained up some of the district staff on putting those up and taking them down and they've since over the last week or so started taking down the, the batting cages over at, at the park. What is that? Cross has been moved from Vets Park staging area. Yep. That's correct. And I know you guys are making some decisions and talking about some things, but we do have a kickoff meeting tomorrow with Hadley and that portion of the work that you guys recently approved uh, last month. So that work will start with a kickoff meeting tomorrow. Questions? Anyone? Okay, thank you. Michelle's going to stay on the board meeting tonight. We're going to rotate through uh, so that there's coverage. If you have any questions after, Michelle's taking the first. So if there are some, she's still here to address them. And then as we move forward, we'll rotate that around so that she can do her thing and one of us will stay for the first and second question. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, everybody. And next, we have our presentation for NIEA conference. Who's taking that? Michela is online and will be taking over as soon as Levi gets her set up. Okay. Take it away, Shay. All right. Um, so this year, um, I attended the National Indian Education Association Conference, NIEA, um, along with Rachel Wolf, Andrea Cook, Carrie Federko, Brittany Jimerson, Stephanie Vogel, and Becky Hill. Um, in previous years, we've taken the liaisons and the, and the two language teachers. This conference is one of the largest on Indian education and um, there's so much there. So I think it's very important that we attend annually. Um, but as you'll see, as we go on, we would like to eventually present there because what we do at Salamanca um, for native services for our students and families is absolutely amazing. Okay, next, I don't know how to switch slides. There we go. So this year was virtual due to all the craziness going on in the world. Um, this was new for everyone, but we made the best of it. What we do is we um, go to different sessions depending on what interests us. And it was just as amazing as if we were there in person. Okay. All right, so there were over 60 present presentations to choose from this year. Um, typically, they're about 200. Um, but even though there, were, there weren't as many as we were used to, um, there were some that were just absolutely amazing. And hopefully next year, we can be um, part of those presentations. And like I said, it's one of the largest conferences on um, Indian education. As I said, we were in awe of some of the sessions. NIEA did not disappoint. Um, what their theme was this year was achieving educational equity through classroom, school, and community transformation. Uh, they're one of the reasons that I wanted to try to present this year was because this is what um, the liaisons and I do. Um, you know, I, we, oh, 
sorry, the dog's coming in. <laughs> There's a, a lot that um, we do for our native services and that all staff do for the district as a whole. But I figured if we could present at this one, this what we do ties right in with the theme. Um, so I just said that. Initially, we were going to present on behalf of the school. Rachel Wolf and Andrea Cook were going to present on the amazing Seneca language and culture programs that they have created um, along with Seneca history and indigenous studies. Uh, the liaisons and myself are going to present on the work that we do. Um, going to these conferences, we've noticed that there's a lot of districts and a lot of native communities that do stuff similar. But honestly, being able to have a full team of family school liaisons, the support staff that the district has already had in place over the years, um, we are able to do so much for families. And we really wanted to get out there and share that with Indian Country. We've done it over the years um, at the different conferences, but this year having a full team, um, I thought it would have been amazing to present. So hopefully next year in Omaha, Nebraska. So let us tell you about our experiences at NIEA, past years and present. So this was my write up about it. Um, I have had the pleasure of attending this conference in different roles over the years. This is my fourth year attending in my current position. NIEA is one of the many ways to discuss Indian education and network. There are so many amazing sessions to attend, but the networking by being there and talking to other educators is immeasurable. Every year I learn so much from attending the sessions and talking to others. I have thought about how cool it would be to present on the awesome work we do here at SCCSD. I started taking Rachel and Andrea two years ago as there is so much regarding language. Last year, the liaisons were able to attend with us and we had decided we would all present at this year's conference. With COVID restrictions, our plans changed. We hope to present next year in Omaha. There is so much content covered at this conference. I would love to see the principals at each building attend at least once. There are so many that would benefit from attending. So we have thought of trying to bring presenters to our district and I'm currently working on this with the liaisons. Um, we all attended different sessions. Um, so we wanna see if we can get some virtual presentations by some of our favorite um, presenters. Um, there have been some sessions that stuck with me over the years and I continue to use the information within my job duties and my personal life. As a team, we continuously discuss the content we have learned and implement it within our day-to-day -day duties. One of the things I love about working in education is that I am constantly learning. I learn from my peers, the students, and families. Sharing tried and true experiences is one of the things that makes us a great team at SCCSD. When we are at NIEA, we choose sessions we will attend and try not to attend the same ones. Then we discuss the day and what we have learned. This usually takes place over lunch and dinner. The conference day is usually 8 a.m. to about 4 or 5 p.m., sometimes later. This year, I was able to attend sessions on the impacts of Indian boarding schools, community collaboration and transformations, language within the classrooms, teacher empowerment in reaching the students, cultural competence for staff, social emotional importance for students and families, uh, representing Native American culture and school curriculum. The most impactful session to me was about teaching differently for children who learn differently. We see this so often. So much goes into why, why a child learns the way they do. This presenter was knowledgeable, relatable, and very passionate about his work in helping children. This was refreshing as an educator and a mother. The greatest takeaway is that I learned a lot in each session, but then I would reflect and think, wow, we do so much of this already. Here are some ways we can improve. These are the presenters I would like to bring in for staff. Through Title VI, I'm working on setting that up. Okay, so, Oops, sorry, I muted myself. This was Stephanie Vogel's write-up. I had two of the um, other liaisons do a write-up about what they took away from NIEA. Um, Stephanie wrote, the focus of NIEA 2020 conference was achieving educational equity through classroom, school, and community transformation. Some of my favorite sessions included difference, disadvantage, or disability, reducing bias in education. Ooh, that was a good one too. Um, commu community and personal healing film helps teachers support students. 
crafting your curriculum to the culture of your students, the way we see a transformation story. Teach, promoting cultural competence for faculty working with Native students, social emotional learning, supporting lifelong well being and success, and cultivating success for students who learn differently. Um, she wrote, this year's NIEA experience was virtual, allowing us to really sympathize with our students and the current situation of our nation. Although I was appreciate, appreciative of this conference, our virtual experience was just not the same. Leading me to my next point, virtual learning just isn't the same as in school in class experience. These sessions refreshed our knowledge and reminded us that children learn and thrive in a warm, loving, sensory rich environment where their physical, social and emotional needs are recognized and met. Environments in which they are loved, respected, acknowledged and treated with dignity. And classrooms that are built based on respect and relationships. Virtual learning lacks these key components necessary like human connection. It is up to us to find ways to reach our students and make a difference. One of my favorite sessions was titled Cultivating Success for Students Who Learn Differently. This session discussed how all children's brains work differently, develop at a different pace, and one must implement different teaching modalities to reach all students. Notice the use of the word differently and how this session focused on the celebration and beauty of differences and the power of differentiating instruction. This session also focused on building positive relationships with students, finding their strengths and building upon them. Every child has strengths and it is up to us to find them and honor them. My greatest takeaway is when classrooms, schools and communities are connected and are culturally sensitive and responsive, they lead to greater outcomes. When considering culture, heritage, history, demographics within the education system, it creates a more equitable and inclusive environment. Okay, so this one, this one was Brittany Jimerson. She's also one of our liaisons, <clears throat> excuse me. Equity is the quality of being fair and impartial. This year's NIA theme was very relevant to the different issues we see as Native American service providers. Equal is not always equitable, especially within the community we live in service. Generational trauma and access to resources create barriers that can lead to struggles in both personal and academic areas of life. A theme that I took from all of the different seminars was the importance of representation, be that in the books, of, the books children read, the faculties that make up committees for special education, and the teachers that teach our students. Okay, next one. Um, day one of the conference, I attended Govita Boudreaux and Donna Patterson's Real Change is Uncomfortable. This seminar dove into the nitty gritty that is Native American special education classifications and the challenges this was presenting to indigenous community, communities in Minnesota. Statistics in Minnesota show that 90% of teachers are Caucasian and that the indigenous students are three times as likely to be classified with an emotional behavior disorder. The disproportionate levels of classification for Native students led to the creation and implementation of the Dreamcatcher Project. This project is funded by the state of Minnesota and requires that a cultural liaison is involved with the entire CSE process. This helps to ensure that students are not misclassified. It's a huge step in the right direction and it acknowledges that our communities require accommodations that others may not need. Based on historical trauma, other demographics did not experience, <clears throat> excuse me. This is a program I'd like to see come to the state of New York. It also speaks to the importance of having representation in the room that makes the decisions. Um, John Rayner presented on the value of family literacy for American Indians. As a non-native, he grew up in the 1950s reading the Dick and Jane readers. He talked about how he learned a lot from these publications. <clears throat> and that when he met his wife, he realized how underrepresented Native Americans are in the literacy world. He also went over the importance of seeing yourself in the stories you read and explained how representation in our education systems are also lacking. I think this is a point that is missed a lot of time when we are looking at any minority, but most especially those indigenous to this country. The representation that is available tends to be inaccurate or misguided and sometimes downright racist. Caricatures and stereotypes do not show who indigenous people are or who they have ever been. They diminish the history, accomplishments, and unique status indigenous people have and always had. Come on. 
if representation was fair and accurate across the board, we would see a huge uptick in, in equity. Students would be more engaged and connected. While this may not be a realistic goal, it would also help if representation within the history books was, bye Tanner. Sorry, my kids are leaving. <laughs> um, sorry. If representation within the history book was equitable. equitable. Our current standards of education and assessments leave little room for nonlinear history. Oral, tradi oral traditions and customs are a large part of family life, but it is often excluded from the narrative because it cannot be sourced. This refers back to the cultural liaison. The cultural liaison helps prevent a student from being misclassified because they understand the dynamics of the families they provide the services to. Imagine a student who saw their culture positively referenced in a school textbook instead of in a his historic manner as if they no longer existed. Same with the books, dolls, and games that children learn and play with. Equity does not have to mean equal. It should at least provide a seat at the table. And then Rachel and Andrea um, just shared a little bit about um, their experience. Regardless of doing the sessions on Zoom, valuable information was shared. The time gathering with peers in our district to focus on Indian education is always refreshing and re rejuvenates our professional goals. Perhaps the most interesting to me is that COVID-19 did not stop Native communities from continuing their efforts for culture and language revitalization, once again, adding to American Indian resilience. We can't wait to present next year and share our journey with the programs we have here at SCCSD. Are there any questions for Shay and the uh, liaisons? I don't think so. Good job. Thanks. Shay, um, for the conference next year in Omaha, is it still going to be um, in September? Um, it should be October. I believe they October. tried to do it around Excuse the same um, time every year. So as far as I know, um, I haven't even looked to see if they have specific dates yet. Usually they have those out at the time of um, this year's conference. Well, hopefully things will lift between now and then, and we'll get back to more traditional uh, professional development at these uh, wonderful conferences and events. Yes, I know that the liaisons and I are still going to present, whether it's virtual or in person next year. Um, I'm not sure if Rachel and Andrea have decided to, but um, we'll leave that up to them on how comfortable they are doing it that way. If you guys are going to present, let us know so maybe a few board members can go down too. Oh, that would be awesome. It is an amazing um, conference. Um, I had been there years ago when I worked for the education department a few times and then four years being here with the district. And there's always something new to learn. But like I said, even just the networking of being there with other educators, um, you learn so much. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next is our presentation for school safety and reopening. All right. Terrific. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank our teachers, staff, administrators, and community members for their commitment to keeping our students in school community safe. I'd especially like to thank Mr. Ray Haley, our safety and security coordinator. Over the past several months, he has done a terrific job of investigating all potential exposures, communicating with the Cat County Department of Health, working with our employees and students, and ensuring our schools are as safe as possible. There's growing concern over the resurgent spread of COVID-19 throughout Western New York, particularly in Erie County. For several months, we've been sharing concern over potential vectors of transmission, particularly from adults on campus. The recent classification of several Erie County communities as yellow precautionary zones has led the district to develop plans to mitigate virus migration from outside the immediate Salamanca community. As a result, the district has determined that staff members who reside in geographic areas identified as orange or red will work, will work remotely during the classification of that micro cluster. We have been in communication with those individuals who may be affected um, and will work to ensure that they are safe and that they can continue to work appropriately. With regard to our immediate area, 
The good news is that the COVID cases in the Southwest quadrant of Cat County remain low and relatively stable. We will continue our current school operations as they are, and we'll be allowing additional students on campus after Thanksgiving if they choose to, and if the infection rate remains consistent. No one will be forced to come to campus. This is based upon the feedback that we have received from our school community through the work of several individuals, including Mr. Bartosik, who has been working very hard with parents, educators, and students to get feedback. We will continue to monitor the local conditions throughout each day as we have been, and we have constant communication with neighboring communities, including those in Pennsylvania. We're prepared to transition to fully remote learning at a moment's notice, but our current circumstances indicate that we can continue to have staff and students on campus safely and that we will continue to do so. Thank you. How many staff does um, that affect, Mark? So we might then, <clears throat> oh, you want to go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, so according to the latest result um, information from Erie County, which is as of about four o'clock today, we anticipate that there are four or five specific communities in Erie County that will likely go to the orange or red status. We see that um, as a result of about 15 to 17 employees. And they range across the board from administrators to support personnel to classroom teachers. Um, so we have plans in place so that in the event that they need to transition to remote learning, um, that they can continue to do so and that we can continue our operations with as little uh, interruption and with as much continuity as possible. So if it's one of the teachers um, that, <clears throat> that has students coming in, mm -hmm. how does how is that working? Are the students just going to a classroom and then she's well, what we would with do, them or, or how correct. is that Depending working? Depending on the circumstances that arise, most of these teachers um, do not have student contact uh, on a daily basis. So a lot of them are either high school folks who can continue the model that we have in place um, remotely. But um, what we'll do is we will likely have a substitute who can monitor in school uh, circumstances. So be the physical presence there. Um, and then we'll work with the teacher to be able to continue to provide the instruction in the classroom. Okay. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, to, to as we begin to look at bringing students back. Um, so we have a number of students who have requested to come back um, and switch from e-learning uh, to a hybrid model. Um, so those students would continue to come back in the model that we have in place, which is two days a week. Um, what we're going to do is uh, basically identify those students so that everyone has an opportunity to come on campus first. We have a maximum capacity, so to speak, that we can do so safely um, in each one of the classes and schools. And what we'll then do is allow individuals to come back four days a week to get to that maximum capacity of the class. So some students will, will, will still offer the range of offerings, 100% e-learning, two days a week hybrid, and then we'll begin to open it up um, for four days a week uh, for those individuals, particularly in grades K through seven. We have talked and are looking at putting a model in place where we'll start bringing back some of our eighth graders and then potentially some of our seniors as well. Any other questions? Okay. Yep, Sue. Our administrators, um, they live in the yellow zone uh, up in Erie County? Some of them do. Okay, what's gonna happen with that? I mean. Are they going to be able to come in to Cattaraugus County or what exactly is that going to, what's going to happen with that? Well, most of, so the, we do have some central office or district office administrators that are affected by that. Much of the work that they do can be continued to be done via Zoom remotely, pretty much the same way that we did work in the spring. Um, uh, the ability now to work from home for particularly district office folks is pretty high. Uh, in fact, we have mechanisms in place and technologies in place to allow 
all paperwork flow, which typically goes through to occur. Um, most of our meetings occur now by Zoom, even if we're on campus so that we can limit the adult to adult contact. So if we have a principal meeting per se, sometimes we'll have people in an office, other times we'll still do it via Zoom, which means people could be literally anywhere in the country and um, the meeting can be just as effective. I mean, that would include you as well as Bob. Quite possibly, yes. Thank you. Administrator in the building, either can. Correct, the building administrators, uh, they at this point in time are not affected by any of the yellow, uh, orange or red potential statuses, right? So there will always be, and there has to be an administrator on site to manage um, circumstances that might arise in person. Would it be if you and Bob could not be here, would it be? Well, um, at the building, the principals are the ones who are really in charge. Okay. Bob and I just pretend to be. Okay. It's really the building principals. <laughs> yeah. And they are? Oh, absolutely. They're, all, they're kind of, you know, when we do have a principal who's unable to be on site for one reason or another, and that occurs for a variety of reasons, we have someone else who fulfills the role of the building administrator for that day. And Karen's always available too. Correct. Karen is available. Right. right. Brad? Right. So our as our plan currently that which we all adopted in August or September indicated that we would continue to provide in person instruction as long as it's safe and begin to increase the number of students on campus. We had a uh, uh, escalation in cases in Cat County and in our area. So we paused that. I believe now we're back to the original plan, which would allow us to begin to bring more and more students onto campus. We can always pause that and go fully remote. Um, the next sort of wave of students who are coming on are those students who had requested about a month ago to come back, our eighth and 12th graders. And then I'm anticipating that we'll have a plan shortly thereafter from Mr. Siebert to begin to bring more ninth, 10th and 11th graders on. Is that safe to say? There we go. <laughs> Can you give us some numbers? Like what are we looking at? You said after Thanksgiving, we're gonna start bringing students back? Correct. How many, how many students in that first week? At the last count, uh, which was about a week ago, there were 14 students at Prospect looking to enter the hybrid model, um, pre-K through third grade. At Seneca, there were two. And at the high school, as Mark had mentioned, we're still uh, working on the logistics for the high school. So that's starting on the 30th? Sometime after Thanksgiving, yes. There, there's logistical pieces to that with transportation, food service, um, other services and transitioning. Um, but um, in talking with the principals, uh, particularly at Seneca, two students is not um, a significant issue that's gonna change. Depending upon where the 14 students are a prospect, I, I don't have that information. I can get that and find that out for you from uh, tomorrow and then shoot out an email. But between pre-K, K, one, two, three, between the five grade levels, 14 kids, mathematically it's about three kids per grade level. And then you can keep us up to date on eighth and 12th when you know numbers. Absolutely. Chris. Well, currently, as far as the eighth grade goes on, on the 30th, Monday and Tuesday, we have 28 students that will be coming in total that includes the students that are already in the hub and they will be uh, going to the hybrid learning model. So ultimately we have about 12 more students coming in on those two days. And then on Thursday and Friday, we have 13 total students coming in to the hybrid model. So that includes the students that are already in the hub. Plus I think there was another three that wanted to come in on Thursday, Friday. Okay. How was learning going in that hub? What was that? How was learning going in the hub? Oh. Um, it's, it depends. I mean, some of the students are doing extremely well. Some of the students are still struggling. A lot of the teachers are still, you know, taking the students, you know, to their rooms to work with them. The ones that are struggling. Um, 
you know, so I guess what I can say is the eighth grade has done a phenomenal job as far as making sure that they are including the students all across the board and at the high school, um, depending on the teachers, because we do have teachers that are, you know, have some family concerns and things like that. Um, a lot of those are still either taking them themselves or finding other teachers to take the students. Do we have any metrics right now that show how well the hub students are performing versus the remote learners? I can find that. Mark, Bob. So the end of the first quarter was just last week. Um, report cards are forthcoming. Um, what I would suggest is that we provide a detailed rundown of comparative um, first quarter results from last year to this year. So in other words, you know, mean, median, mode for class grades, um, number of passing, failing students. Um, and then we can even disaggregate that by students who are fully remote and in the learning hub. Um, and then we can uh, take a look at that in more detail at the first meeting in December. That... Or the retreat. Or the retreat. <laughs> so what, what's our next comparable? Because we got, for the high school, we got the hub or remote learners. So is seventh grade possibly our next closest comparable? because they're in classrooms? Well, that's a good question. So to me, it's where did these students perform last year to compare to where they are now? Um, that would probably be the most logical metric that I could put in place. Um, and again, class grades are, while we would like to think they're very objective, they're gonna be somewhat subjective. Um, anecdotally, I can tell you that most teachers will tell you they are not where they would or last year at this point in time. Um, no matter how hard they work, we're realizing the efficiency of remote instruction or part-time in-person instruction is not as effective as a routine regular basis. And that really just sort of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, we can come up with a way to quantify that for the, for the next meeting. Um, and take a look at wh what type of time frames we are different from the content that we would have typically taught. Our teachers are already sort of narrowing the curriculum as much as possible to focus in on the essential learning and concepts and make sure that the students aren't necessarily doing a bunch of busy work, but are really doing meaningful work that's aligned to what's critical for them to know in that particular subject area. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that reduction, um, my understanding from talking with teachers is that they're still not where they typically would be. Just trying to. Sure, fire away. I think we would be looking at, um, prior to our pause, we had been, every Monday, been allowing more students onto campus. Um, that allows for us to logistically ensure that we can are prepared with things like food service, supervision, and transportation. So I would anticipate that we would continue to bring students on each Monday until we reach our, a capacity. Um, and then, you know, uh, that would, largely coordinate with the high school and how that schedule is going to look. We know that high school is more challenging in the manner in which instruction is delivered with students moving from class to class because of the, the format and the tenure areas or um, subject certifications for teachers. So, you know, if it's, uh, you know, grade three or grade four, one teacher, and we can keep a pod type setting, when we get to the high school, that becomes more challenging. I know the eighth grade has developed a process to bring students back that minimizes um, cross-class contact, um, as well as the amount of and number of teachers that interact with each group that is designed by them. So I think what we would do is look at how that model is working for the eighth grade and then see how we can upscale that to nine, 10, 11, and 12. Um, but to more specifically answer your question, I would anticipate that each week we would begin to phase more students in. Uh, 
Uh, that's a good question. The area that we won't be able to meet are the students who want to be on four days a week. Um, we just that we will get to capacity before all of the students who want to be here four days a week can be here. So we will be limited um, and some students won't be here as much as they'd like to be. Prospect is probably the closest to capacity in terms of numbers um, because of the, the, the numbers of students that have uh, already entered the hybrid model for Prospect. Absent pulling other staff members like uh, intervention specialists and other certified staff that aren't quite at capacity and having them do traditional homeroom core content instructional areas, we're, we're reaching that point, we're close. We're not there yet at Prospect. And if we start adding more students significantly, um, we will have to take a look at the spacing. Um, we have the staff, but to meet the requirements of the social distancing, uh, we're going to be really, um, it's going to be a challenge to get them back the full four days without something model-wise adjusting, but prospect is the closest. Go ahead. <laughs> I see the red light on. <laughs> I was just curious. Um, we talked about the evening tutoring classes. Has that started? Yes. When? Um, Mr. Do you want to touch base on the after school tutoring? I'll hand it off to Mr. Schubert here. So we're in the third week of after school tutoring the first week um, and we're still adding more tutors um, as they become available. I think actually we're, are we appointing a couple tonight? I believe three tonight. Um, that will be starting later this week. Um, the first week, honestly, even though we had it, we promoted it, there wasn't too many students that actually attended it. Um, over the last last week, we had more students that actually attended. Um, still not quite where I personally wanna be. Um, so we continue to promote it. Levi's put out all calls to the students. Uh, we've posted it on websites and things like that. Um, and it's just, I think it's a matter of continuing to get the word out and continuing to promote it for that extra help. So I think currently speaking, we have every night there's something going on. Um, I don't have the actual schedule in front of me, but it is on the website too, so. And that's at high school, um, Seneca and Prospect both have um, evening hours that are offered as well. So I know at Prospect, um, there's an hour from five to six um, and five to seven, but we have so few people who have been showing up from six to seven that it's just been reduced to uh, five to seven. Okay. Uh, the Seneca Nation started tutoring. Uh, have we partnered with them at all? Are we collaborating with them? We are, in fact, Nancy um, Williams, the director and I spoke last week. Um, we actually had a Zoom conference to make sure that we were really sort of all on the same page. We identified some issues um, with technical um, and internet access. So we're having our computer technicians work with um, them just to make sure and identify whether it's our device or their, or, or the network, or if we can support that in some other way. Um, and we have offered opportunities for their, their tutors um, to be and receive the same training that our teachers do. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? We're all good? Okay. All right, thank you. <laughs> Get a drink of water now, Mark. <laughs> All right, next we have our uh, public communications. Uh, our first is our Title VI Parent Advisory Committee, and I think uh, Jess Kraus is going to speak to that. Could we unmute Jess? Hello. Yes. <laughs> now I scan out. <laughs> so um, 
name is Jessica Kraus. For those that are on that don't know me, I am with the Title VI. I am currently serving as the vice chair. And I am just going to make this short and sweet. We had a meeting uh, that was originally slated for October 14th, but we had it rescheduled to November 4th. So um, we had talked about the survey on the safety plan and uh, there was a lot of interest in seeing the results. So if we could have some follow up on that as to when, when we could see those details. And there was also a note that there wasn't a spot for parents to submit thoughts and feelings about working uh, from home or returning back to school. So I guess more of a, an open common area on these surveys was, uh, was a topic of interest during our meeting. Uh, we also covered that we will continue to brainstorm along with uh, Michelle Radai on other possible presenters and ways that the grant can be expended. And then uh, we will also continue to do um, some more debating on the multiple year grant cycle. And we understand that needs to be decided by March of next year. And further on in the meeting, there was another part that was brought up about, um, we would like to see a component about the drug epidemic and related loss of loved ones in the community. And a suggestion about that was that perhaps the Seneca Intermediate and high school SROs could possibly include a component to that effect on their uh, pages. And another item of interest was uh, moving forward on introducing traditional Seneca food within the school service and seeing if we could uh, somehow mediate that to uh, include the students that are not in school. So um, numbers would be helpful. And further on in the meeting, um, we had made a motion that um, also I'd like to say thank you for allowing the Title VI to have the standing item in your agenda and uh, we had made a motion to have a rotating schedule between our members to uh, to have some sort of a face-to-face -face in this kind of a forum with you. So that will be um, established. And furthermore, we had also talked about, uh, we would like to have our own kind of a survey to follow up I know we're, we're having on the survey this year with all different aspects within the school district, but uh, it is what it is during this COVID time. And if that's our best mode of communication, uh, we'd like to keep pushing forward with that and uh, be an active player in developing that kind of a survey. Um, and yeah, I guess those were the highlights. Um, any questions? When is the next Title VI meeting, Jessica? Um, it'll go back to the normal schedule with um, following up after the IEC meetings. Okay. Yeah, it was just an oddball month. So for the remainder of the school year, we'll be following the, the usual schedule. And uh, we look forward to um, hopefully reinvigorating and coming up with a, uh, a frequently asked questions and kind of pushing for more community involvement, parent involvement. And so we look forward to having any sort of input, we're, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. So for all the questions, you want us to send the responses right to you, Jess? Uh, you could, I mean, I, I sit as the vice chair and uh, we're a pretty close knit group. And also I, I'm glad that uh, Justin Schaff is on board. He's been uh, great at keeping communications going. So, you know, the more that you could uh, CC any one of our group members and, um, I advocate also looping in Justin Schaap, and I appreciate that he has been brought on board within the school district. So, so yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks you for presenting tonight. Does anyone have any questions for Jess? Okay. All right. Thank you. And so let's move on to our central office message. Karen, do you want to start? No? 
Okay. Karen's good. Mark? Sure. Um, let's see. So I mentioned before that the first quarter has come to an end. Um, and with that, I just want to acknowledge that we understand that there's quite a bit of concern and anxiety over grades. Um, the concern is on the part of our students, grown-ups, teachers, administrators, and honestly, pretty much anyone that's involved in schools. While there are certainly some students who are excelling in our current instructional environment, we have a large number of students, grown-ups, and educators who are struggling. There's no easy solution to the struggle, but it is important, and we want the school community to know that we understand and are willing to help however we can. We understand the struggle and the anxiety that occurs um, when a Zoom lesson freezes or simply stops. We understand the difficulty of working all day and coming home to the challenge of teaching our loved ones and ensuring all homework is done. We understand the frustration of grown-ups with students who simply don't participate, no matter how many times they promise to do the work. And for our students, we understand this isn't what school is supposed to look like. That an 80 is not the same as a 95 that you might be used to, that you miss your friends, your teammates, your teachers, your coaches, and maybe even your principal at this point. We want everyone to know that we've started to put a plan together for the return of students when the pandemic passes. Over the next several months, we will develop a plan that will provide students with the content, skills, and most importantly, the support necessary to be successful when they return. Until then, I encourage all of our students and grown-ups to work hard and be the best they can. But if you simply can't connect and the frustration level is getting high, just turn it off, read a book, and tell us how we can help because we understand and are willing to help in however way we can. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. All right, let's move on to our Board of Education message. Dale, do you want to start us off tonight? Thanks, Dale. Barb? Thank you, Marcy. Um, you know, I appreciate everything everyone's doing. And Mar Mark, I liked your message because I think so many people have COVID fatigue. I know I do. And the sooner that everybody follows the science, the sooner we'll be out of this and back to school. Thank Thanks, you. Barb. Thank you. Sue? I liked what Miller said um, as far as if anyone has any questions or any problems to come to the school, tell them, not just sit at home and cry about it or just not do it. Um, tell someone you need help. And I hope we can get that across to the kids because I appreciated that if I had a kid in school and uh, I think it would work a lot better. Thanks, Sue. Brad? Thanks. Gary? Um, yeah, I have, uh, I don't know. I just want to throw out that we err on the side of caution. Just because the southwest quadrant of Cat County has been relatively low in our COVID numbers, doesn't mean it's going to stay like that. Doesn't mean that means, you know, we should reopen. Um, I just want to point that out that we need to move cautiously. Um, it's difficult. I mean, we've, we're hearing about all these numbers rising all around us. And we're hearing about the people who really don't care 
about what's going on. Um, I constantly hear about young people partying because they just don't care. They feel like they're going to be just fine. They're going to get this. They're going to, they're going to manage. They're going to be okay without any regard for the people around them, the elder community around them, things like that. It's, it's difficult to hear this and then still try to think about we're bringing more kids back into these buildings. Um, you all know my opinion. I, I share it openly. I shared it at the last board meeting. I share it again. I don't think it's time, but I will say I'm only one of seven board members. And I know my opinion doesn't mean it's worth its weight in gold. It's just my opinion and that's it. But I just really want to reiterate that we use all caution. I brought this up a while back. Who are the medical experts or who are the professionals we're talking to when we think about reopening? You know, I even said, why don't we consult with somebody? Um, you know, and I wonder, have we? have we? Have we talked to somebody? Are we talking to the county health leaders? Are we talking to the state health leaders? Are we talking to a medical professional? When we make these decisions, how are we proceeding? We're, we're in a better situation than most school districts because we can afford to hire a consultant. Some school districts are struggling thinking how they're going to make ends meet. So that's just one of the things that I look at as we keep moving forward and, you know, try to plan our future out. What do we do? What are we doing to make sure that we're doing this in the best way possible? You know, education is important. I mean, I'm, I'm one that says that all the time. Education is important. I've been saying it for years and years and years, you know, but so is everyone's health and safety. And how do we put those on the scales and weigh them and balance them? and move forward with our best intentions. So that's more or less uh, my two cents for the night. Um, cautionary, just making sure that we're doing everything possible that everybody's gonna be safe. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie. Meg? Um, just, I guess, echoing. You know, similar similar concerns and just to remind everyone that all it takes is you know a couple of people who are sick in our community for us to have to go to 100 percent remote learning um so it's i completely understand parents and community members who need their children in school like i get that um i think that in k through 12 it's a little bit different risk benefit analysis than say in the colleges you know that have made the decision to go remote just because we know we have kids in our district who are safer when they're in our schools during the day. Um, but I, for everyone listening to this or who may hear it later, you know, again, it only takes a couple of people to, to jeopardize that. Um, we can bring back you know, students and have them doing really well in school and then the COVID cases rise and we have to shut down and it ruins it for everyone. So you know, I think about that every time I go out into our community and I'm in Parkview or I'm at Worth W. Smith and there's people not wearing masks, you know, not taking those precautions. Um, we're planning on bringing students back right after Thanksgiving. I you know, want everyone to think really critically about their Thanksgiving plans. I mean, I know I have, that is my favorite holiday of all holidays. We will be celebrating with four people who live in our home, you know, this, this Thanksgiving. Um, you know, those two weeks after Thanksgiving, those two weeks after Christmas, um, after our holiday season, you know, those are, those are big times. So hearing people in our community that are traveling, that are going to attend large events, that is, that is jeopardizing the health and well-being, you know, of people in our community. It's also jeopardizing our face-to-face -face learning in our schools. Um, so really take that seriously and weigh that decision very seriously. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks, Meg. Um, <clears throat> I just want to first start out by giving a shout out back to uh, Tristan Bass for uh, completing his diploma and for showing up here tonight to actually let us present it. I know there's a lot of times when um, kids graduate and I sign off on the diploma, Bob signs off, Chris signs off on it, but then they never come to be formally recognized. And I think it's really, really great statement to show somebody that took the time to come back, to complete, to get his high school education. And um, he's the kind of kid that when COVID's over, <laughs> I'd love to bring back to talk to other kids that are struggling so that he could share kind of what he went through and how he overcame and got his diploma, especially in a 
pandemic situation, you know, so I just want to really uh, congratulate him again. Um, I agree with what everybody said about COVID and I tell my kids all the time, keep your circle small. I keep my circle small. I feel like the only friends I have are my immediate family. <laughs> um, and that's okay because I want everybody to be safe. I don't know how much we send home flyers to reiterate, uh, wear your mask, um, make sure you, you think about your choices, about your social circle. Um, just like Carrie said, you know, we hear about kids partying and they don't think about it. They don't get that sick from it, um, but it's the parent or the grandparent that's really gonna suffer uh, who they've been around. So um, I agree with when we're gonna bring kids back that we need to think about it. I think we've done it in a good manner so far, not that we're perfect. Um, and not that bringing a kid back isn't going to result in maybe us closing down, but it, it doesn't mean that any of the kids we have here couldn't cause the same issues. So I think we just have to keep reinforcing it and re-educating our kids so that they can go home and spread the word of wear your mask. Um, you know, how do you say wear your mask in Seneca? Maybe it's something we could teach our kids so that they understand it and they can promote it and they can say it in the community, you know, if I see somebody not wearing a mask, I say, put your mask on, you know, it's for my protection as well as theirs. So we all have to lead by example. And uh, sometimes I feel like we have to speak too and make sure people know that because they don't wanna follow the rules, um, it could jeopardize other people's safety. So uh, let's just keep making sure we educate people and make sure we do, uh, um, that we're acting in a safe manner. The holidays are coming up, um, which should be a joyous time for everybody, but I think we're gonna be doing a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of Zoom calls for, for Thanksgiving. So, um, you know, it's a new way of life right now that we have to, that we have to think about. But Zoom did um, for Thanksgiving say that they are going to let people surpass the 40 minute free period. So you can have a really long Thanksgiving meal um, with your oh, family awesome. over Zoom for free. You do not need a pro account. <laughs> yes. Well, that's awesome. Um, so that's all I have uh, is really just can't kind of what everybody else is preaching wear your mask, keep your circle small, and think about who you could be affecting because this pandemic really is it's serious and uh you know we don't want to lose any more loved ones than we already have lost so thank you um i'll turn it over to bob certainly i yes i I, I well i don't know about that <laughs> um so uh, a couple of things and my list is kind of lengthy so um i apologize for that but i think this is very important information uh, in response to some of the board members' questions about our um, resumption of the gradual, slow, methodical phasing in, uh, this is something that we have been talking about and planning with our principals, with our buildings and grounds team, with our safety committee. Our plan has not wavered with safety, wellness, and instruction as our fundamental priorities. That's not going to change if there's two kids from Seneca that join our hybrid model or more students. If we reach the point where a member of our team says, hang on, this is too fast, this is too much, this isn't safe enough, we will throw the brakes on it instantly. We won't necessarily need to wait for metrics. We've got a pretty good handle on where we're at. With regard to uh, conversations with medical experts, I, I can assure the board that on a regional Western New York, BOCES, and even across New York State, I'm on the phone as is Mark and Ray Haley, regularly talking with outside experts. Um, we had multiple conversations with the county health departments, Cattaraugus and Allegheny County, as well as a regional superintendents meeting with superintendents from Niagara, Orleans, Erie, Chautauqua, Cattaraugus and Allegheny County last week. And these were some of the same topics that we discussed. I can tell you that it's very clear, and, and Mark can probably confirm this, that county to county 
there isn't agreement from the health departments. Just the memo last week about the microcluster strategy from um, Governor Cuomo was met with varying levels of interpretation from the respective county health departments. We are fortunate in our area that our numbers are substantially lower than other counties, but that doesn't mean that we are out of the clear yet. I think we all recognize that this is a high risk. And as Dale said, this is a pesky virus that um, doesn't care who you are, doesn't care where you live, doesn't care what you do. If you let your guard down, you could be potentially at risk. I can tell you we've met and have spoken with our staff frequently and the level of uh, compliance with our staff is exemplary and they get it. Uh, in talking with our kids, they get it. Um, they don't want to be the student that screws it up for the other kids, whether it be clubs or activities that we started uh, in very small doses to increase um, based on low levels of participation or larger groups that may be looking to meet in the future, they get it, at least our kids do. I'm not sure that I could say that universally across all K-12 platforms, but I sense that our kids get it because I'm seeing them doing it with the safety and health protocols. There are competing factors here that um, complicate this. I, Carrie, I think you had asked a question earlier about what's, you know, how do we know they're doing? I, I can't give you a number that 36% of our kids are doing better than last year. What I can tell you is if we talk with any of the kids, they hate this model for the most part. There are a few students that are doing exceptionally well in a hybrid or a distant learning uh, remote model, but by and large, this is not what students have become accustomed to, whether they're in kindergarten or first grade or 12th graders. And that, that model is hard to, uh, to, and that history, that muscle memory of coming to school and the social construct of being in school is a powerful thing for teenage kids and they miss it and they want it. But they also, at least from my experiences with the students, they want to do it safely. They want it faster, but they also want to do it safely. Last week, I did share our assessment of the microcluster designation and what we would do. I can tell you guidance from the county has changed twice since then. Our plan, I think, is measured, it's thoughtful, and it communicates to our community what we will do if it happens. I can assure you that I've spoken with countless other school districts that are chasing a plan and not out ahead of it. So our plan may change. It will very well change as the demographics and the details change on the ground, but at least we've let people know so they can plan. And I think that's what COVID has robbed us of most desperately is our ability to be in control of what's happening to us. Any chance that we can provide some level and semblance of order for our families, I think is something that we should also actively consider. Some of our kids, some of our families just simply are at their breaking point of being home and being isolated. And that wellness piece troubles us greatly. Last Saturday, we did start to begin the conversation at our board retreat about some social emotional learning and curriculum. And that is something that will be coming soon to a board conversation very soon in the near future. The last thing about COVID that I wanna say is that we have done uh, um, an audit of where our staff live and 76% of our staff live within a 15 to 18 minute drive from here. So that's a pretty small area to be concerned about. It's predominantly Cattaraugus County. If we expand that to 25 minutes, that gets us to about the edge of Erie County. And that number goes up even higher. If our staff is in a zone that is designated orange or red, we've already made the decision that they should transition immediately to e-instruction, e-work remote work. That's not that we think that they're unsafe or not that we think that they're putting us at risk, but we want to maximize our level of safety and their level of safety as well. And we will monitor that as the circumstances change, but it's important, I think, to let the community know that we have a plan, 
it's still rooted in safety, wellness, and instruction. And the second something threatens or jeopardizes those three attributes between Dr. Beeler, our three principals, Mr. Haley, our buildings and grounds crew, Mrs. McGarra, the board, our community, our parents, we've tried to approach this from an open communicative fashion. And I think that the fact that we're spending this much time last weekend and every week since this hit in March, I think is a strong symbol that this district is deeply concerned about our students and our staff and our community. So I'm gonna transition off of COVID for a second here and hopefully not talk about it again tonight. Um, today I had a statewide call uh, with two um, incredibly important elected officials. Uh, one is the chair of the Senate Education Committee and other members of the uh, Senate Education Committee. And we talked about the perpetual threat from the governor's office of withholding state aid. As a standard operating practice during the COVID, the governor's office has used the COVID pandemic, and there I go again, it's, it's hard to get rid of it, um, as a continuing threat of withholding state aid and delaying and slowing payments to districts. Um, just two weeks ago, the state announced that and went back on what they had said in the spring that they would provide reimbursement for transportation aid, March, April, May, and June for districts that shuttled um, materials and supplies and food and textbooks and computers uh, to students. And the, uh, the state had said that they would honor that commitment. And two weeks ago, they pulled back on that and have held 20% of that transportation or they have withheld that transportation aid. A rough estimate for us, according to Mrs. McGarrett, and Karen, please correct me, is approximately $440,000 in lost transportation aid the state promised they would provide to us. The state has to honor its commitment and can't just talk about equity and being a champion for keeping people safe. They have to start putting their money where their mouth is. And frankly, I don't want to get political, but I will because I have to. Part of the conversation in the call today was the state is still not settled up with 2016 and 17 and 2017, 18 Native American tuition payments to Salamanca schools of approximately $1.2 million that have been properly filed, reconciled, verified countless times, and to use the pandemic as a slow roll of paying payments from 2016 is abominable. The state needs to stop playing politics with the funding for school districts like Salamanca and Gowanda and Silver Creek and Lakeshore and countless other districts that rely on that aid as revenue and honor its commitment. Friday of this week, we'll be sitting down again with other statewide elected officials from both sides of the aisle to push this forward. We cannot let the conversation shift from anything other than keeping our kids safe and honoring the funding commitment that New York State has promised dating back to 2016. A few other items. Um, last evening, we held architectural and engineering firm interviews and we'll be talking a little bit more for the rest of the board uh, in executive session tonight. Thank you to Mr. Colton, Mrs. Ray, Mr. John, Mrs. McGarrett, Dr. Beeler and myself uh, for uh, conducting those interviews and we'll share some more information in a little bit. Uh, and I think lastly, um, we had a board retreat. Let's, let's transition to some really good conversations. Um, in the multi-purpose room on Saturday of last week, we discussed our technology platform used by our instructional staff to provide digital learning to our students the voluminous levels of professional development that we have offered to staff so they could transition to this level of instruction. We talked about curriculum and data points and our beginning conversation into our ongoing pursuit of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Thank you, Mr. Schapp, for providing us that, as well as Mrs. Beatty and Mrs. Schnaufer for providing those levels of trainings to our board. We did walk away with some homework um, because it wouldn't be a retreat if we didn't uh, have a honey-do list and a, and a responsibility matrix for us to pursue. And that includes individual learning plans post-pandemic for a focus with our students, a deeper dive into assessments and to better understand where our learners were 
before this occurred in March, where they are now and where we want them to be when we resume school. Additional interventions and staffing needs for the budget for 2021, continuing our discussions with diversity and following up with a follow-up board retreat date, I believe in January. Um, and last two things, uh, about two and a half weeks ago, we did have the Indigenous Policy and Procedures Forum. We had 11 individuals participate. Uh, according to my records, that is a record of participation and attendance. So Zoom, thank you. Uh, our second and uh, last forum meeting for the IPP is 12 3, Thursday, December 3rd. Uh, and we will make sure that gets out on the website and electronically so that we can have individuals participate. And the last, last, last thing I promise, um, I did send congratulatory letters to Salamanca City Mayor-elect McGarra, President Pagels from the Seneca Nation, congratulating them on their elections. And we are working to set up a joint meeting with the mayor, President Pagels, Treasurer Armstrong, Teresa as board president and myself to discuss items of mutual interest, collaboration, and how we can work together for the betterment of our communities. And with that, thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, our consent agenda. We need a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Barb, second by Meg. Are there any questions on the consent agenda? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. We have no old business. Our new business is our contract with Cataraugus County Department of Social Services. Bob, do you want to just explain? Yes, this is an annual um, contract extension for our relationship with county social services for students placed in foster care within our district and outside of the district that we might need to place through the county. Thank you. So we need a motion to approve the Cataraugus County Department of Social Services contract. Motion by Sue, second by Carrie. Are there any questions on this contract? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And next is our Cataraugus Wyoming County Project Head Start Agreement and Collaborative Agreements. Um, this is the UPK grant, and we were waiting final approval from the grant from the state before we could execute the contract. We finally got it. It's better late than ever. <laughs> okay. We just need the money from them now. <laughs> yep, that's all, that's all we want. Show us the money. So we need a motion to approve uh, the CAT and Wyoming County Project Head Start Agreement and Collaborative Agreement. Motion by Meg. Second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And next item C is our contract with new Ed, EDU LLC. Um, who wants to speak on that one? Bob, Mark? Mark will take it. Sure. Um, this is a contract with a consulting group that will provide us with in-person um, expertise on the current um, social emotional level of our students broken down by subgroups. Um, they will do that on a biweekly basis and then provide recommendations to our administrative and pupil services team so that we can more specifically tailor our curriculum to make sure we're meeting the needs of our students as they arise. Um, I will make a note that due to the astuteness of one of our board members. Um, the attachment that you saw, if you looked at this a couple days ago, has been corrected. Um, it was uh, misfiled with one of the um, components that we're looking at adding in with our staff. So uh, that is now correct um, in both uh, sheets that are attached. So this is just student and we're going to address staff later, correct? Yes, uh, the staff um, portion does not, due to the quantity, does not need to come before the board. Um, that is a significantly less um, dollar amount, so the superintendent can engage in that contract. I do also just want to note that the full funding of this is provided through the New York State School Improvement Grant, um, so it does not actually come out of our uh, budget. Okay, we need a motion to approve the new EDU LLC contract. Motion by Barb, 
Second by Sue. Are there any questions? Okay. Was this um, public content? I believe. Um, I don't know. I, I know. I know it's not tonight. But was it? Yeah. I, I put it under administrative. I probably should have put it under public. Well, because that's what I thought when I looked at it previously that it was under public content, but tonight it's not. Okay, that I don't. Okay. It was my error. I was in the middle of what? A webinar at the same time. Yeah, I gave it to her. You noted it, I think, last night or then Saturday, yeah, maybe? Saturday. Saturday. And I talked with her this, more, this afternoon, so it was a late minute change. There was certainly no intent to hide it. It was just. Oh, I just wanted to clarify that. Right. Okay. All right. Thank you. So we have a motion by Barb, second by Sue. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then we have our SASA MOA for our safety and security coordinator. Um, Mark, do you want to take that? Uh, this is a memorandum of understanding to place the safety and security coordinator um, into the school administrators um, and supervisors association. It's really sort of um, a uh, just a process. The position had not been uh, had not existed in the district um, previously. When a new district or a new position is created, um, one of the bargaining units needs to sort of claim it. Um, and since this position did not exist in the uh, SASA contract, this is an MOA that agrees that the position now resides with SASA. And there was some language changes that just simply needed to be added. Um, it does not affect, I guess it mildly affects the um, terms and conditions for the employee um, in the fact that they're now represented by um, SASA um, as opposed to CSU but all of the parties um, understand are in, and are in agreement. It's also more appropriate in this um, organization because this particular position now will be supervising security guards um, and that would place them into a supervisory position and therefore that association. Okay, we need a motion to approve uh, the SASA MOA. Motion by Brad, second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Opposed? I will abstain. Motion carried. <clears throat> and then we have our STA, SASA District Interim Technology Director, MOA. Would like to speak on this. I'll start. Um, I'll start. This is a joint um, uh, agreement between the Teachers Association and the Administrators Association to allow a longtime staff member who has administrative certification to fill our interim technology position um, and take a leave of absence from their former teaching association position to become the interim director for the remainder of the school year. And um, the terms and conditions dictate, uh, as we have done in the past, uh, with the leave of absence that that employee retains um, their position that is um, unencumbered at this point in time um, at the end of the uh, school year should either they choose to return or we choose to go in a different direction with the position. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the interim technology director MLA. Motion by Barb. Second by Mike. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And next we have a position creation. Bob, would you like to explain that? I'm going to toss this one to Mark, Mark because he's deeply Sorry, involved Mark. with the grant. to talk all, all sorts right. tonight. Good. Uh, so this is a position that is a um, provided to us through the My Brother's Keeper um, grant, the Native, specifically the Native American program. Um, we had anticipated starting this much sooner in the school year, but due to um, the pandemic, things got paused a little bit. Um, the funding for this has been extended um, in additional five months. Um, so 
Uh, we now will be looking to create this position in alignment with the grant goals, which are to create a um, mentoring program for our native male students. This individual, um, once on board, will begin to put that program together and we look to have um, partial implementation of it begin in January, February, um, and then continue for three years afterwards, um, funded through the grant. And then if we determine it to be successful, um, we'll take a look and evaluate it at that point. Awesome. So we need a motion to create the mentor program coordinator. Motion by Carrie, second by Brad. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then we have uh, the creation of a student activist club. So does anyone want to just go over? Yeah, I can do that. Um, there are a group of students, uh, predominantly at the high school, uh, that have approached staff and want to become more involved with advocacy for important causes that they are interested in, whether it be uh, the environment or social justice uh, issues or gender and equity issues. So the um, students had approached um, the high school and Mr. Siebert and some staff members have uh, agreed to step up with the student activist club. And uh, uh, I think this is fantastic that our students are actively engaging in advocacy. And uh, they invited me to their inaugural meeting. And I can tell you, I couldn't be more proud of our students uh, for being champions for justice for everyone. So I fully support this. I might just caution you that if you vote no, you may become <laughs> their first action. So that might be interesting. Uh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Sue made the motion. We need a second. Meg, second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. I do think a few of them were actually on the meeting earlier. I'm not sure if they're still on, but no. um, good for them for. Good. I'm here, Reese. <laughs> yeah, all right. There you go, Reese. <laughs> Next, we have some surplus, so we need a motion to approve the uh, item for surplus. I think we did that too much. Motion by Dale, second by Barb. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then next is our certification for uncollected school taxes and our tax collector's report. So we need a motion to approve um, the certification and the report and the total taxes due are $18,700.23. So we need a motion. Motion by Dale. Second by Sue. Are there any questions? Ellen. Okay. Why would we even list the town of Napoli? Well, they don't owe anything. Sure. sure. Because last year they owed like three dollars and sixty-six cents, and they are part of the part of the group. Well, so, so that I don't forget next year, I want to make sure that I ask for that paperwork in case there is something. Okay. In case they owe another three bucks next year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want my two dollars. <laughs> okay. We don't want them to feel left out either. They right. did pay all their taxes. Yep. Anybody that wants to send us money can. So we have a motion by Dale, second by Sue. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Motion carried. And my favorite, capital project change orders and allowance distributions. So we need a motion to approve the, I don't know, 50 change orders that are listed on the page. Motion by Carrie. It is my favorite, you know. <laughs> finance does too. Yes, and finance, correct. Right. Okay. We got a motion by Carrie, second by Meg. Are there any questions? All in favor? 
Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. <clears throat> Item K is our use of reserve funds. Karen, do you want to go over that? She says she was on her way, she knew. <laughs> Yeah, um, based on our existing um, reserves policy, uh, we have an annual review of that policy, which takes place after the audit is completed. The audit was accepted by the board on November 6th. And uh, at last finance meeting, I went over these with um, the finance committee to determine how much of the unreserved fund balance gets put away into the reserves and used based on our existing policy. So this is the, the net um, gain uh, for the reserves from um, unrestricted into general fund or from unrestricted into the actual reserves to increase them. Okay, then we need a motion to approve the use of the, re uh, the fund of the reserves. Motion by Barb. Second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain, motion carried. And next is our junior accountant contract and MOA. Karen, do you want to go over that? Yeah. Why it's here and not in personnel, but um, I had 14 people apply for the position. We interviewed six and the selected individual, um, Alicia Timblin, is a native Salamanca. Uh, she graduated from here and uh, I'm looking for her forward to her starting. She's actually starting tomorrow, which I'm psyched about instead of having to wait a couple weeks for somebody to come in. The only problem is we have nowhere for her to sit. So <laughs> <laughs> she can have my desk. <laughs> kind of tucked in the corner for right now. But um, the contract is standard for uh, anyone in the uh, confidential managerial section um, of the business office and operations. Okay, so we need a motion to approve the junior accountant contract and MOA. Motion by Brad, second, second by Dale. Are there any questions? <laughs> and we got a, we got Meg for runner up. <laughs> So we have a motion by Brad, second by Dale. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And then our new uh, contract for our summer food service program. Or I'm sorry, budget development. I'm not wearing my glasses, so if I miss something, please stop me. <laughs> Doing great. Thank you. I hear you soon. So we need a motion to approve the budget development calendar. Motion by Meg. Second by Carrie. Are there any questions on the calendar? Anything you want to point out specifically, Karen? It's exciting. Okay. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> motion by Meg. Second by Carrie. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And our contract for our summer food service program? Karen again. Okay, motion by Sue. Need a second by Dale. Are there any questions? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And item eight is our personnel consent agenda. It's rather lengthy. We do have four people with us. Okay. So we need a motion to approve the personnel consent agenda. Motion by Mag. Second by Barb. Are there any questions? All in favor? 
Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. And we've got some introductions, Bob. I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Siebert uh, for some tenure uh, acknowledgements. Um, one of the individuals that we uh, approved just a few minutes ago for our interim uh, technology director position is Marcy Brown, who was here. Uh, Marcy has been a longtime Salamanca warrior, uh, a former elementary teacher, sixth grade teacher, science teacher. And uh, Marcy's leadership in the past year has been incredible and uh, quite visible within technology, but also within our STEAM program as one of our uh, teachers um, providing STEAM instruction to our students. Um, I was uh, contemplating how I would describe Marcy, having traveled with Marcy for a week with the Odyssey of the Mind team a few years ago to Iowa, and I thought um, she kept um, seven young 11-year-olds and the superintendent in strict uh, order and keeping us marching, and the trains ran on time, and Mar Marcy is incredibly hardworking, conscientious, um, uh, eager to learn, uh, a tremendous sense of humor and just an incredible work ethic that um, I think exemplifies what warriors do each and every day. So I'm delighted that Mercy has uh, agreed to step up into this leadership position. I don't know if Dr. Beeler wants to add anything else. Well, it's kind of hard to add uh, to that, but even in the short time that she's been in that role, there have been some significant and very positive changes, um, both from the personnel as well as the service side. Uh, we're excited to see what happens over the next several weeks because um, when we return from January, um, there's a pretty significant project that she started that will come to fruition that will really be a benefit to everyone in the Salamanca community. So. Um, I, we're excited to be working with her to see her in that role. And I can tell you that um, the department has seen improvements uh, already, and we anticipate a lot more positive things coming shortly. Congratulations. Okay. Next. So I'm, uh, I'm pleased to announce or uh, Recognize Leo Ward and Larry Wheeler as two of our high school tenured teachers are going to be earning tenure coming up uh, at the turn of the new year. Both of them uh, came in and filled some very vital roles for us. Larry teaching the upper level math and Leah, she's on the screen there. She was teaching uh, some of our upper level Spanish. Um, both of them have stepped to the plate and, and are teaching actually AP courses for both of us. There's Mr. Wheeler on the screen now. Um, and I guess what I can say is they came in halfway through the year. And I know from experience that that is a very difficult thing to do. And they fit right in from the get go. Um, both of them, again, building phenomenal relationships with the kids and offering, again, those upper level advanced classes that we really want to promote for our students. Um, and they go above and beyond and uh, just do a phenomenal job every day for us. Um, and are true leaders in each of their departments. So uh, I am very, very happy and pleased to have both of them uh, come on as tenured teachers for the Salamanca High School. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So our last tenure appointment uh, is Amy Whitman, who uh, is the art teacher at Seneca Intermediate School. I did see um, um, Mrs. Beaver on earlier, but I'll jump in here and if, uh, if um, Nikki is still able uh, and with us to, to jump in. Uh, Amy has um, been with us for a few years, uh, come to us from a neighboring district. And uh, since Amy has joined our art department, um, her level of commitment with our students, the quality of the artistic work that students demonstrate, uh, her participation as a team member within the Seneca family is outstanding and exemplary. Um, on a personal note, I've never met uh, a teacher as enthusiastic and as eager to come to work each and every day as Amy. Uh, we are blessed and delighted that Amy is part of our Salamanca family, and um, 
I, I am just always awed at the level and the quality of work that comes out of Seneca. Uh, and that's a direct uh, attributable factor to Amy and her ability to work with our intermediate students. So Amy, congratulations and thank you for all that you do for our ERD program. Thank you. Thank you to I everybody. Think that's it. That's on the call. Anyone? Let me just double check. I don't think we're missing anyone. Okay. Then we're going to go on to our personal consent agenda item number two. Um, so we need a motion to approve um, a tutor. A tutor who is near and dear to my heart. <laughs> So we need a motion to approve uh, consent agenda number two. Motion by Dale. Second by Carrie. Are there any questions? All in favor? Opposed? I will abstain. Motion carried. And she's home studying, so that is why she's not Zooming. As it she has a test tomorrow. <laughs> and we want A's. <laughs> uh, and item nine is our information uh, board reports. So we have our capital project summary um, for October 31st, our enrollment data, and then our upcoming events. Um, our next board of education meeting is December 1st. So we hope to see you all here. And now we need a motion to go into executive session uh, for the purpose of personnel and exit interviews. And architecture. And architectural. Thank you. And we, we could ask for Penny to join us. Um, we may take action afterwards. Um, I'm not certain. Okay. Motion by Dale. Second by Barb. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Stay safe. Keep your circle small. Wear your mask.